have an interactive question answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we'll have an interactive question and answer session towards the end. At the time, uh, feel free to raise your hand or ask a question or type it in the chat and we would love to ask it for you. Just a reminder, as you know, we are recording this for uh, tonight's event. And tonight we'll be talking to Neil Patel uh, about his debut novel, uh, Tell Me How to Be. He's first generation Indian American who grew up in Champaign, Illinois. And his debut story collection, If You See Me, Don't Say Hi, was a New York Times book review editor's choice and was long listed for the story price and Espen Words Literally Prize. He currently lives in Los Angeles. Now I would like to welcome Neil. Um, thank you so much, Neil, uh, for taking time out from your busy schedule and joining us uh, and discussing your book, Tell Me How to Be. How are you? Thanks. I'm good. How are you? We are doing good and we are very excited. Um, but before we dive into the discussion, um, I was wondering if you can share a little bit more about your background and your journey so far uh, as an author. Sure. Um, well, I grew up in a small town in Illinois, um, Champaign, Illinois. It's actually not that small. It's a university town, but it felt very small when I was growing up um, in the 80s and 90s. And um, I... Uh, started writing, I'd say around college. I read the work of Jhumpa Lahiri, um, who's a brilliant writer. And it was the first time I'd really encountered the work of a South Asian writer writing about life in America. And it kind of made me want to tell my own story. And so I started writing short stories and publishing them in journals. I moved to LA. That led to a two book deal. Um, tell Me How to Be was the, the second of the two. Um, and I'm, I've also recently started to get into television and film writing. Um, oh, so, wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I have a couple of projects in development and um, LA is the perfect place to, to do that, so. For yeah. sure, for yeah. sure. Um, um, can you tell me a little bit uh, more about how did this book shape in your mind? Like, how was your writing process? How did the idea of this book came to you? Sure. Um, the idea came to me around 2019 when my parents in Illinois put their house on the market and they received an offer within one week of putting it on the market. And all of a sudden I was being told that I had to come home and pack up my things and take whatever I wanted. And um, it sort of made me think like, what is that like to confront this place that I had kind of left behind so many years ago and all the memories and, um, uh, even the secrets that I had had in this place. Um, and so that's what sort of was the genesis of the book. And actually what's funny is the offer ended up falling through and they didn't sell the house for another two years. Um, but that, that idea was still in my head. And then actually just before the pandemic in early 2020, I went home to visit my parents, mm. which for what I thought was gonna be a month or two and I was gonna work on my book. I ended up staying there almost the whole year. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think something about being in this place that shaped me and formed me where I experienced all of these feelings of isolation and, and homophobia and all these things I experienced, it helped me kind of create this, this story. So most of the writing of this book actually happened when you stayed with your parents during pandemic. Yes, yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, there was really no, nothing else to do. So I was like, I might as well just write. <laughs> <laughs> that was productive. They yeah. just spent COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, while I was reading the story, and uh, I'm also from India, living in the US since last 20, uh, 28 years. But um, have you um, felt the weight of telling a story about South Asian gay characters? Or did you feel kind of relieved being able to represent a part of the culture that's still not easily talked. Mm. I think what I felt more was relief. Um, you're right, there are there is such little representation for you know queer South Asian people. Um, and I remembered I watched a movie called Love Simon, um, which is a really wonderful kind of coming of age, coming out story for a young, young man. Um, who I think in the movie is like 16 years old. And I had a really re emotional reaction to that movie, not necessarily because of the performance or the story, which was a great film, but I had this realization that 
I missed out on something in my life because I was in the closet and because of, you know, this was the 90s when homophobia was really rampant. And I realized that I couldn't get that back. I'll never be able to get that time back. You know, I didn't get to have a boyfriend in high school or, 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 or you know, a date to the prom or any of these things. And um, it was through that that I, I figured, well, if I can't have that, I'm going to live vicariously and write a love story, even though it wasn't always amazing between Akash and Barth. Um, I thought if I can't have that, I can at least write it. Yeah, well, um, no, it was it was actually very interesting for me to read this uh, part of the culture, as I said, which you don't see it still, it's still in a way uh, you don't it's people still don't talk about it. It's still a taboo subject. You don't still, it's definitely better than 90s, like you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still in, I think overall, it's still a very tough subject for people to talk about. Mm -hmm. We're getting better <laughs> as a society. I think we're moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, but how much uh, do you think you, you relate to Akash's character? Um. Yeah, I, I relate to him quite a bit. He, he was definitely inspired by a lot of things that I've experienced. And this feeling of shame and fear was something that I definitely experienced. Um, and the fear of kind of bringing shame upon your family or, or what will happen to them and, and what will people say about you or, or them. Um, so yeah, Akash is definitely very much a big part of, of my, my experience. And like you said, you kind of lived uh, through the character what mm -hmm. you were not able to do. yeah yeah that's why I gave him a lot of like nice steamy love scenes and <laughs> and a boyfriend <laughs> and a love interest and another guy and <laughs> do, do you worry about that writing source because this book did have some like you said some steamy love scenes like do you worry mm -hmm. about what other people are gonna think your people you know your family yeah. or yeah. other Indians you know, what's funny is when I write, I'm not actually thinking anybody's going to ever read it, you know, <laughs> even though, you know, even though the book was under contract, you just don't know. And I mean, that's why I like writing because it's the most honest and pure thing you can do because no one really is looking over your shoulder. It's just you and your mind. And, um, then when I know the book is coming out, that's when I start to think, oh God, like, what is this one auntie going to think? Or I think it, um, I saw one of my aunts in London sent a picture of me holding my first book and there was quite a bit of sex in that book and all I could think about was like oh my god did she read it like what, what is she thinking but um fortunately no one has ever like said anything so <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um, um another thing that was very um obvious in this book is the music was mm -hmm. a very you know, integrated part of this book and um, Akash's character is an upcoming songwriter what a, a role music does play in your own life uh, life do you write um songs or how, how important music is in your life yeah um yeah music is a big part of my life um i actually wanted to be a songwriter um i used to like yeah i used to like write little melodies and i had like i would have this microphone i'd make little demos and stuff they were terrible but um but music was a big part, especially of my childhood. Um, I think what I liked about music was it was this bridge for me to the outside world. So even though my life at home was very different from other kids at school, we spoke a different language, we ate a different kind of food, there was a different set of rules for me and a different culture, I knew that there was music that could kind of connect me to other kids at school. And I remember being in class and somebody talking about a song on the radio or a music video that they saw. And for those few minutes, I was able to participate in the conversation and nobody was thinking about our differences. We were all kind of like united by the music. And, and that's one of the things I love about it. That was easily to connect with people through mm -hmm. music it was the more, most yeah. commonality of that's nice. Yeah. Um, Reno's life um, looked very perfect to um, outsider but uh, clearly she was not happy um, from inside with her overall, um, how her life went in a different direction than she thought. Mm -hmm. What does perfect mean to you? Because like in, in life, she had a doctor husband, they had money, beautiful kids, 
Um, she had social circle, everything, as I said, from outsider, everything, all the boxes were checked, but still she was not happy. So what, what, in, what is perfect in your world? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, I think perfection doesn't exist. And, and I think I sort of believed this lie, like many of us did, that if you have certain things, you know, the American dream, the spouse, the house, the kids, the security, then what more could you want? Um, and so, yeah, with somebody like Renu, she did kind of have it all. But what she didn't have was um, honesty and um, autonomy and agency. And to me, if there was a perfect life, a perfect life is an honest life in which you accept yourself fully and wholly and, um, and you don't sort of care about what anybody thinks of you or you, know, you, you sort of ignore people around you and, and you just kind of like are content with yourself. And it's not about what you have, you know, it's about who you are inside. Um, and that's so difficult, I think, especially in the South Asian community where, you know, you come to this country when my parents' generation, they were all very new to this country. And, and how do you measure your success? You measure it by the square footage of your house. What kind of car do you have? Is your kid going to med school? Um, you know, those kinds of things. And um, I was that kid that like didn't do any of those things. I actually flunked out of college, which was really <laughs> quite traumatic for my parents, but um, yeah. <laughs> Very opposite of what Indian parents expect from their kids. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I, I, you're so right. Like per perfect, perfect doesn't exist. I think it's a per perception of, per mm -hmm. of a person. Uh, what I think I go, what perfect to me and you come and you fix something and now it's perfect to you but you just messed up my perfect mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's the way you look at it and what works for you that's what perfect is in my uh, uh, world also uh, and um, it again going I I keep going back to uh, our culture because I grew I was in I grew up in India until I was 20 years old so I so many things were also embedded in me the, uh, the society norms Mm -hmm. were embedded in me and now it's been it's different now for me but so when when I saw Renu's character uh, uh, reached out to Kareem uh, her first love that was in a way I was very happy because you don't see a female character in, in mm -hmm. our in, you know in our um, culture Mm -hmm. Making first move if I if I say so. So uh, what was your thinking behind, um, uh, you know, the whole, the way you portrayed Renu's character and how she approached? Yeah. Uh, Renu was definitely uh, very much inspired by my mother. Um, my mom has always sort of been um, at home very outspoken and you know, she never lets my dad get away with anything. I think my dad's like frightened of her sometimes. <laughs> but um, I never like my mom was always so different from what people think of when they think of like Indian women. They think of them being subservient and docile and quiet. And my mom was none of those things. Um, I can still hear her like screaming in, <laughs> in my head. Um, but, you know, the one thing I found interesting about my mother was I don't really have any stories of her from when she was younger. I don't really know much about her past. Whereas with my father, I know all these things. I know that he streaked across campus. I know that he had a girlfriend who was Muslim, which at the time that was taboo for Hindus and Muslims to date. I know that he flunked, like he failed a year of med school and had to repeat it. I know all of these things because his friends and his brothers would tell these stories and it's always in jest, kind of this boys will be boys mentality. And it kind of told me that men of a particular generation and even now are allowed to have indiscretions and women aren't. And so the one thing I had heard about my mother was from her sisters who said that apparently there was a man on a motorcycle who used to visit her and she would stand on the balcony kind of like Romeo and Julia and he talked to her. Oh. <laughs> and she like vehemently denies this. And she's like, there was no man on a motorcycle. They're lying. And you know, <laughs> and, you know whether there was or there wasn't, I could tell that there was this sense in her that she was not allowed to be portrayed that way or, or, or make any mistakes or do any of those things because she had to kind of be perfect 
and yeah, the perfect wife yeah. and the perfect daughter. And so then I thought, well, what does that look like several years later? You know, what what did you miss out on? What are your regrets having had to be that person your whole life? Yeah, because like you said, certain things what men do, they easily they can even if it's a wrong thing, they boast about it mm -hmm. because uh, it's somehow it's just. I don't know, it's manly to do wrong yeah. things. I don't know, I, I don't understand, but that's how it is. But for women, uh, it, like, even if they have done it, because uh, they would not talk about it because yeah. they are going to get judged. And yeah. that was, uh, you know, the stamp of perfect might not stay with them. So it is, um, so certain things you see uh, how it's, you know, male and female behavior in, uh, mm -hmm. especially in our, our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, just digging a little more in our culture. Um, did you, um, obviously, it's, I, I cannot relate to uh, the whole experience, but like, was it how hard it is for you to uh, come out to your parents? Was it, and how, how was the whole experience? If you don't mind sharing, you can very yeah. well say, no, it's, I don't want to. Uh -oh. No, no, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, it was really difficult. I came out to my friends first. Um, and then, you know, I waited several years before coming out to my parents. Um, and it wasn't even so much their reaction I was afraid of. It was that I didn't want them to worry. And I think, especially having immigrant parents, they're always worried, right? Like, everything is new to them. They've never raised children in America. They don't know if they're doing it right. And, you know, um, and so I was worried about them and I was also worried about how they would be treated by the rest of the South Asian community because that's one thing that was very important to my parents and to a lot of South Asian parents is having a community. And the last thing I wanted was for them to be exiled because of me. And so I didn't come out to them for a number of years and then my first book came out and there were stories about queer characters, but I guess they didn't like make the connection or because I just hadn't said it to them, they just didn't mm. know. Um, but I, I did an interview that I didn't think anyone would ever read. Um, and I was very candid about my sexuality. And I didn't realize that at the same time, my dad was eagerly Googling my name because he was like <laughs> excited about my book and everything. And he found this interview and I get a phone call at 1030 at night and you know when you get a phone call that late from your parents it's either because something bad happened or you did something bad and so i was thinking oh gosh what is this and he he was like you know is this true and i said yes it's true and the first thing he said was um that's fine we love you and the first thing my mother said in the background was who else knows <laughs> and <laughs> And she wanted to kind of get ahead of this. So she had to be go into PR mode and be like, okay, how am I going to deal with all these aunties and uncles? And so she just wanted to know who knew. And so she could like move forward. But, you know, they, I, I'm very fortunate. They've been very accepting. And um, recently my sister told me, apparently my mom told her, um, well, I hope Neil finds a nice man now. Oh. And, you know, as Indians, you just, your parents just want you to be married. So <laughs> now they want me to be married to a man. So... <laughs> <laughs> that's true um another thing that made me think and actually I'm, I'm going away with my kids this weekend and i'm gonna have a conversation with them um the, uh, the scene between um two brothers mm -hmm. oh my god i'm i'm blanking out uh, akash Bijal. and Bijal. oh thanks Bijal. Yeah. yes so when they had their fight and they are actually going at each other uh and uh he says he had to be perfect mm. because you are not mm -hmm. and you and two kids at the same time cannot give parents part time and that's why he had to be on top of everything he had to be perfect and now as a par uh, parent's perspective i was thinking that have i ever done anything and i'm going to have this conversation with my kid i have 21 and 20 year old uh that did they ever felt like that? Okay, today uh, she's being bad this year. So I have to either not share anything that I'm going through with my parents or I have to be just, you know, perfect. So in your, how did you, I, because I think it's a, I just love how the way you put it. Do you, and it's so true. Um, do you think this is something you experienced? Like, how did you even give this uh, feeling to the characters? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's definitely something I experience. I do think as siblings, sometimes as children, we feel that we have to shoulder our parents' burdens. And um, I know I never like to see my parents worried about us. Um, because obviously you don't want to see your parents, you know, suffering in any way, but then to know that it could be because of you makes you feel anxious and guilty. And like, I remember for the first, you know, maybe 20 some years, my sister was the one who did everything right. She, you know, got straight A's, she had friends, parent teacher conferences were always amazing. They said amazing things about her. She went to college, grad school, she got married um, to a doctor in a beautiful ceremony. And I was the one who was constantly messing up. And I remember she got mad at me once and she's like, you know, look at what you're doing to mom and dad. You know, they're worrying about you. And she was angry with me. And at the time I didn't understand it, but now I understand why, obviously because she loves her parents. And it's interesting because later she started having her own issues with her marriage. And, you know, my parents were always worried about her, her marriage and what's going to happen and all of that. And I used to get annoyed with her, you know, for oversharing every little fight she had with her husband. I'm like, you don't need to tell mom and dad everything because they're just going to worry all the time. So I think, yeah, I think as children, we, we feel that. We feel our parents' burdens. Oh, boy. And now I'm in my and parents' chair, so I don't know what answer I'm going to get from my kids. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I was nitpicking of little things that I, I connected with so many things as a, uh, as a family, uh, dynamics and everything. Um, and even though uh, your book didn't end in Happily Ever After, uh, Akash didn't get part, Reno didn't get Kareem, um, but I was actually very disappointed for once since Reno approached Kareem, I wanted her to get, uh, get uh, her first love. I was, uh, why did you decide, uh, why did you decide to break Reno's heart? Yeah, Kareem is a big, nobody likes, nobody likes Kareem and what happened with that. Um, <laughs> I think what I realized in writing this story was that I wasn't really that interested in Kareem. Um, he seemed a little too like idyllic and perfect and didn't really have, I don't know, I didn't really connect with him and I, I didn't know why until the end. And I realized it was because Kareem really was there as a representation of this life that Rainu never had. You know, this choice that she never get got to make, you know, he was that choice, but she wasn't allowed to make it. And because she wasn't allowed to make it, she couldn't let it go. Um, and all of these years, she kind of romanticized this idea of Kareem and of, of their relationship and what she could have had with him if she hadn't been brought to America and had this arranged marriage and lived with Ashok in this town where no, no one understood her. Um, and by the end, I realized that what was there and what was most important was her family and her relationship with Akash. And I knew that the two had to come together in the end. And I think the way for them to come together was for them to not get the thing that they thought they most wanted because what they really wanted and what they really ne needed was their love for each other. Um, and I knew that, that um, I knew I also was gonna have this moment where she finds this letter that her husband wrote her. Um, and I wanted, to feel those emotions and I wanted her to feel those emotions um, and I had to just take Kareem away. Even though yeah like you said nobody liked and neither do I but <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope uh, Renu makes peace with um, herself in that situation. Uh, do you uh, what's what's in pipeline what what's next for you like you said uh, can you live, stretch a little bit more about like you said you're now tv shows and yeah. what, so can you share something with us yeah so um i'm developing the book for for television um right now i'm working with some producers and um so i'm working on the pilot for that and then um i also have a movie uh in development with lily singh who's like oh. this yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, I know Lily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So she's um, and that's um, a comedy. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I I actually got to be in a writer's room for an Audible series, um, recently. That's like a murder mystery. And so yeah, I'm just kind of exploring writing in in all different kind of modes now. Um, in addition to working on my next book. Okay. And and do you 
know like do you know what your next book is about or it's still very yeah it's very different from tell me how to be it's more of a thriller but like a funny one so um i'm i love where we are now in kind of both books and tv where people are kind of blending genres so one example is there's a show on hbo called barry which is a really great show um, because it's suspenseful, it's thrillery, but it's like really funny too. It's like mm. hilarious. And so, yeah, this this book is kind of um, a genre bending novel. So, yeah. Do you find uh, the writing a little difficult or it's just a, because it's so totally different, you have never written, you find it, it's more exciting because it's different than your other two. Yeah, it's more exciting. Um, the, the plotting of it is a little bit more challenging because it's different. It's, it's, it's um, less emotional stakes and more mm-hmm. kind of psychological um, stakes. And so um, that's different, but I'm really enjoying it because it is so different. Yeah. yeah. We're looking forward for it. And you said this, uh, tell me how to be, you're turning into a TV show. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm adapting it now. It's in the very early stages, but um, yeah, I'm working on the pilot now. No actors decided yet? No, no one yet. Um, okay. But I have in mind, I don't know if you ever saw Mississippi Masala, but um, yes. Saritha Chowdhury, who also has done a lot of other work since then. But I, mm-hmm. I really love her for Renu. Um, yes. She has this very kind of sophisticated look about her and I, I would love to have her play Renu. Wow, no, we can't, can't, can't wait, can't yeah. wait. That's great. Um, so now, if you don't mind, I would like to open it up to our uh, patrons, and if they, if they have questions, they can, you know, um, ask you. So I see already somebody, Angela. Oh yeah, Angela, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. There. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So yeah. Hello, Neil. Nice to meet you. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. I like your book very much. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's a little shocking at parts, but I like it. <laughs> I wanted to ask you at the very beginning, you did not uh, like to share the costumes of your parents, the music, the friends, the foods, but later in your book, you embrace them. Mm-hmm. That, is, that is really beautiful. I, I am from Colombia. My husband is German and my kids were born here and married to Americans. So for me, it's very important that they know about our costumes. So that I like about your, towards the end of the book, you embrace your friends, your costumes, your beautiful, uh, I will say it's like, oh, I don't know. How do you call the clothes for a man in India? Oh, kurta, kurta, and kurta, yeah, kurta. yeah. And the food that is so delicious that I'm sure mm-hmm. everybody loves. Yeah. So how did you come about? It, it, it happened with my kids at the very beginning. They didn't want to hear very much of our culture, but today they ask me many questions and they want to know everything and they want to speak Spanish and it's, it's fun. They yeah. did learn German when they were young, but, but it's been a lot of fun to share all that now with the grandkids and all. Yeah. So why, how did you feel at the very beginning when you were growing up, you did not want to them to know about your costumes or how? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I think there was a lot of kind of shame in being different. And I, I know as a child, I was oftentimes the only brown kid in the class. And I came from a culture that was so distinctively different. You know, our religion was different. Our clothes were different. Like everything just looked so different. And I was just constantly afraid of being ostracized and exiled. And all I wanted to do was to fit in with all of my classmates. And so part of that was kind of rejecting this part of me me that was so, so different. And what's interesting is Um, We are in such a great place now where people are kind of reclaiming their identity and their culture and appreciating appreciating it. And I think what it does is it takes people, you know, kind of doing that in in sort of public and and large platforms. Like, for example, we didn't have, when I was growing up, there were were no South Asians in Hollywood or in the music industry or, or anywhere. There was no Mindy Kaling, there was no Hassan Minhaj. But now as we're starting to see ourselves sort of on screen, um, 
and in so many different platforms, we feel less kind of alone. And um, I think there has been this kind of collective movement of people, particularly from ethnic communities, really kind of reclaiming their culture and appreciating it. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Do we have anybody else in the crowd who has a question? Okay, Mrs. Thayer, if you want to unmute and ask. Well, I loved your book, Neil. It was great. Um, and I like, I love there was an underlying theme in, throughout the book of the love you had for your mother. And are you close to your mother now? Yes, I am. Um, you know, uh, it, we, we didn't always, we weren't always close when I was younger. I think we both kind of learned how to be with one another. And she learned how to have a child who was different. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to have a mother who, you know, wasn't always able to express herself the way I needed her to, you know, and I learned how to interpret her love. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't always gonna be, you know, showered over me like my father did. Um, oh, my darling. And I think that, um, I think when you understand somebody and you understand where they're coming from, you can then have a really beautiful relationship with them. Right. And I, I love the way you portrayed her friend, Chaya. <laughs> yeah. That was a wonderful relationship. Oh, thank you. The two of them. And and I, I was looking at the page on two. Do you have your book with you? I, I have my book. Did, right? <laughs> I don't. It's somewhere there. Um, well, on page 293 when um, she was going back to her house after not having met up with Kareem mm. and Chaya was comforting her. And, and she says, Renee, ever since we were young, we have lived for other people. We were good daughters for our parents, good students for our teachers, good spouses for our husbands, good mothers for our kids. We have been good cooks and good cleaners and good hosts for our guests. When we came to this country, our husbands were lost, remember? And so then she goes on to say, you know, all the wonderful things that they have done mm. in their lives and that she should not feel any sense of guilt. Mm. So I like the way you express that, those Thank thoughts. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sayer. You're welcome. Uh, do we have anybody else? Anybody else have a question? Okay. I have, I have one more. Go ahead, go ahead. When you came out to your parents, um, did they say we knew or we suspected like you portrayed it in the book with Akash? Yeah, my, my mom claims that she didn't know, but I don't believe that. Um, <laughs> I feel like every mother knows. I. Yeah. I <laughs> But my dad said something really funny. And he was like, you know, I thought so because you like to wear those tight pants. And <laughs> 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 okay. yeah, so it was the pants that gave it away for him. <laughs> That's funny. How, how old were you when you came out? Um, it was not that long ago. It was, I, I was 34. So after you had written the book? Yeah, okay. after not this book, but my first book after okay. I wrote the first book. Yeah, after yeah. You wrote that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's a great book. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Um, just asking one more time, do we have any other question from anybody? Yeah, I have. I just want to make a comment. Go ahead, Lois. Uh, just that the more we learn about other cultures. And sometimes Americans are right, are right, especially right now, don't understand cultures that people from other countries, and we can learn so much from them. And I have over the years working in the medical world and meeting immigrants and refugees from all over the world. And it really, we can learn a lot. And I love the book. Oh, thank you. I want to thank you. Thank you so much. No, uh, thank you, Neil, so much for sharing your book with us. We all loved it. And it was definitely a great addition in our library. 
uh, because a few years ago, probably Sabina can vouch, when you look for a diverse box, you did not even have an option. Now, at, at, even if you wanted to buy it, nothing was out there for us to add it to a collection. That's not the case anymore. There is still, there are areas uh, we can uh, improve, but uh, definitely it's better than before and your book definitely adds to it. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much for taking your time tonight and sharing um, your parts of your little bit of your world and um, uh, your book with us. So thank you so much. Thank you and thank you all for being here and thank you for reading. Yeah. And good luck you. to you. We Thanks shall so read much. your next books. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Thank you to you too. Thank you for leading the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, no. yeah I think he was, he was great. I hope you guys enjoyed. He was very open. He shared everything we asked. Um, so no, he was great. Thank you so much, guys, join for joining us tonight. And okay. you did a great you did a great job, Pinky, leading the discussion. She right. Did. Thank Excellent. You. Very very nice. Thank you very much. No, thank, thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Bye.